Hello and welcome back. Today we are going to be doing a tutorial on the basic economics here for Victoria 3 as part of our larger tutorial series which is getting revamped for patch 1.5. In this tutorial we are going to be primarily focused on buildings but we will also talk about uh, construction, uh, kind of how to evaluate what to construct and also government spending uh, when, in terms of the budget. But coming back to the buildings, we are going to be principally concerned with four things that are highly interrelated. Um, they And because of this, we have to discuss them kind of all a little bit and then talk about how they relate to each other. And this is first, we're going to be talking about profits, which is the weekly balance, which is going to relate to the second thing, which is goods. Uh, you put input goods into the building and you get outputs, and then this will determine your profit profits. However, these buildings, uh, these goods have variable prices, so the profits will be highly variable. And very importantly, the profits aren't paid out to you, the government. Instead, uh, they are paying out to your budget. They are instead paid out to the pops or the people working in the buildings. Um, they are getting paid out to the ownership class of them. And also, they are getting paid out in terms of one of the inputs of wages. And so all these systems relate. And finally, we will also be discussing various uh, ideas relating to production methods or PMs which are all the options you can choose inside the building. Now, after we talk about this, we'll need to talk about how do you get buildings, which is, of course, construction, and what strategy for construction is. And construction is a form of national spending, so we will talk about how you want to formulate your spending strategy around the idea of wanting to construct buildings. Now, for this tutorial, there will be uh, chapters down below, which you can click on and use to navigate, as well as at the end, there will be just kind of the strategy without the explanation, if you are interested in that, without the explanation of the video. And without further ado, let's dive in. So now we're going to talk about profits, goods, and prices, how they relate. Um, so we're going to take a look at this explosives factory in the Midlands. We can see that they are producing 50 explosives here. And the value of these explosives is 2.2k. We get this by multiplying the number of explosives, in this case 50, times the local price here in Midlands, which is 44.6. Multiplied together, you get this value. The same is done for the sulfur and the fertilizer as the inputs, the number multiplied by the price. And then we take the output goods and we minus the input goods plus the wages and from this we get the weekly balance and so this weekly balance is slightly positive as it's positive the cash reserves build up which affect how big your line of credit is however if you do not have a sufficiently expensive you know output good you will not have a profitable building and so this is a kind of an important illustration if we take a look in wallonia and we take a look at the explosives factory there it has the exact same production methods however there is no demand for explosives and so the explosives are cheap and so we are going to have a negative balance and so if we unpause the game what will happen here in wallonia is the cash reserves will first drain and once they reach zero then the employment of the building Building will start to deteriorate uh, which means we will be sending you know these pops back into uh, the subsistence farms which is not ideal so we're gonna jump into our market tab and take a look at prices and explain how they're calculated so if we have uh, an even number of sell and buy orders in the market uh, we can scroll down and see here we have roughly even buy and sell orders of sulfur the price will be based on the base price of the good uh, if you have an excess of you know sell orders so if more is being produced in your market than being consumed the price will fall towards minus 75 percent of that base price or just a quarter and this equilibrium happens when there is exactly twice as many sell orders as buy orders you see that's not exactly the case here or the case here with wine but minus 75 percent is the absolute floor conversely uh, we see that it will trend towards plus 75 percent if there is exactly double the buy orders of the good than the sell orders of the good. Now there's a strategy that's not quite optimal that a lot of beginner players use that's very useful for illustrating an idea and that strategy is just build the most expensive thing uh, that you have and uh, this is a decent one because it will almost always be profitable so we here see here fruit is the most profitable thing and we know it's going to be more profitable because the output good is more expensive. Even if the input goods are fairly expensive it's still probably going to hit. Again kind of a reminder you know the, the 
it's because these explosives are expensive versus these explosives uh, that this building is profitable and this one is not. The building in Midlands is profitable, the one in Wallonia is not. Uh, and so if we, you know, build banana plantations, this would be useful. However, what people think a lot philosophically or what the tendency is, especially if you're newer players, you're thinking, I'm trying to decrease the prices. I want to get the price of goods down. And this is not the case in Victoria 3. You would actually prefer middling prices over anything else. Um, the reason for this has to do with how price is calculated because if you have really expensive stuff, you see here, we, in order to have fruit be expensive, we need to have way more buy orders than we have sell orders. And so if we somehow, you know, start building a whole bunch of these buildings that are going to be really profitable, suddenly they'll become less profitable as the price drops right but also if you have a ton of you know, if you have more buy orders than sell orders and these buy orders are places like the explosives manufactory like let's say we are talking buy orders for uh you know the sulfur we are going to suffer more because if we have let's say 100 explosives factories and only 10 sulfur mines right something to this effect and where we have way more explosives factories we will have way more explosives factories having worse weekly balances because there are more sell order or sorry there more buy orders for sulfur driving up the price of sulfur and so when there are twice as many buy orders for a good um, this means you are going to have a whole bunch of manufacturers that are suffering or your pops will be suffering which is like less important and so it is not the case that you want really expensive prices it's not the case that you want really cheap prices middling prices would be preferable however Whenever you have expensive prices, this is also a good thing because it gives you an opportunity to build an extremely profitable building. And while we really don't actually want to build fruit, uh, using this kind of heuristic of coming into the market and seeing what's expensive can give you a good hint at what you should maybe build as long as you consider other things. We'll talk a little bit about why fruit's not so good later. So the production methods, or PMs, are going to be all the different options you can choose on the building. They are generally acquired with technology, and later ones are going to be better. And this is how you maintain an advantage relative to other economies and other countries, is through technology. Uh, the brown PM will be the primary PM. It does most of the heavy lifting. Uh, secondary PMs, which give you more output options, are going to be in purple. Labor-saving PMs, which don't output any new goods, but instead reduce the amount of labor, these are going to be in uh, green these become useful when you start running out of pops um, and then uh, also we are going to have the ownership PM which determines who owns the building and who's going to be getting paid is going to be in blue here so if we take a look at the price of hardwood on our market, which we can produce if we would like, um, we will see that it's actually at minus 75. And so while later PMs are almost always better, and this hardwood PM is a later PM, since the prices are low, it's actually not going to be profitable. So if we turn this on, suddenly our weekly balance turns negative. By the way, this uh, you know tooltip can often lie, especially if you don't already have full employment, and so we will turn that up. Also, another thing that will not be profitable, but this sawmills is going to be a better PM. It's so much better because it's only five tools to in order to increase, go from 30 wood to 60 wood. But if we turn this on, we will likely turn less profitable. And the reason being is because we have a shortage of tools. And so we will want to turn that on. Something you also might have noticed when we turned that on is a very important thing happened. Uh, we went from being merchant guild in terms of our ownership, which is shopkeepers. We'll talk about this a little bit more later. Um, but we went from being merchant guild owned to being privately owned. And so very often the primary production method will also influence what the ownership of the building will be. And so you will often want to play around with these. Uh, you will almost always want to switch up the primary one as much as possible an important exception being you will not always want to do this on oil or when there is a scarcity of resources because as you see we're less profitable putting on uh you know the tools if there's a resource in our market that is at plus 75 very often it will not be worth it to use the pms that are available to this so this is kind of one instance uh that can be good and also it means that you will have to pick and choose which oil pms you use and also if you're not running 
running out of labor specifically, using the labor saving PMs will generally be bad. And if you are using running out of labor, using them will be very good. Some are more efficient than others. Chainsaw is a perfect example. You actually never want to use chainsaws ever. This is the worst PM in the entire game. And finally, we can think of, hey, we actually would like to get hardwood production. Notice how using sawmills allowed us to do focused hardwood production, but we have to figure out a way to increase the price of hardwood. If we want to do this, the PM is more efficient. We could, for example, build more arms industries which use hardwood, and you begin to think of stuff in terms of a market thing where you are trying to figure out how to use the best PMs um, because you know that later PMs tend to be more effective. And so you could do stuff like this. You can also come in here and we could decide, hey, you know, we come into here, we go into our market, we see that it's really, really cheap and we can see we can have profitable exports. And so part of the game is trying to massage your way into using better PMs and also understanding when certain PMs aren't going to be good, which is often the case in the later game when you start running out of oil, you won't want to use all the oil PMs. Just to note that in patch 1.5, there's almost always a glut of hardwood. Uh, and so what you are going to often want to do is you are going to overvalue stuff that has hardwood as an input. Um, there's not too many things that have this. Uh, one example is the furniture manufacturers. I think that might be where we are consuming actual some hardwood. Uh, also is the arms industries as well as the secondary production method on ships after which they stop using hardwood. So we can come into here into East Prussia for a good example without getting too much into the math and spreadsheets and stuff of how we can massage uh, something to be more profitable. So we see we're already on our primary PM dye workshops, great. We're profit of 133 and we wanna turn on this craftsman sewing. Now the output of this, uh, you know, the 30 luxury clothes, if we're kind of at base prices, is going to be worth considerably more than, uh, you know, the 30 basic clothes we give up as well as the swap from using 30, uh, you know, of this fabric uh, to using 15 silk, however, However, you look at you can see here while we have a base price of silk plus 2.9 k instead of plus 133. That's very nice. However, this hasn't adjusted yet, and it's actually plus 75 price, which makes the weekly balance negative. So now we're going to start firing off pops, um, you know, until we can hit an equilibrium uh, where we are going to be at least break even, and so. What do we do? Well, one thing we can do is we can, uh, you know, first, let's not tear off this, but second, we can put in an import route, we will sort by market price, and we see there is more than double the buy orders than the sell orders, we in fact have so no sell orders, and so not export. We will want to set up a new import route, and if we set up, a, you know, we're just gonna set them all up uh, just so things progress quite quickly here, but once we set up those import routes and we let the game think a little bit, the silk has come down, back down in price, and so, Ooh, we see the luxury clothes are also expensive. So why don't we also export the luxury clothes while we're at it? And uh, we will be able to see, we're just not gonna worry about what's profitable right here because we're trying to illustrate an idea. Uh, but we are going to see suddenly now the building's wildly profitable because the price of luxury clothes has gotten high. There's no longer a glut of luxury clothes and the price of silk has come down. And now this weekly balance is considerably better. It's considerably better than it was before. Now, you know, it'll still need to take some time to adjust, but this is one thing you can do in order to turn on production methods. You can rely on trade to source things that you don't have and you want to do this very aggressively. You can also, you notice here, we have really cheap, we have a dual track output on this clothing. So if our regular clothes are really cheap, we can export these and move it to middling. And if luxury clothes are cheap, which is what we had, we can export them and move their price in the direction of middling. Because if we take a look at the luxury clothes in the market and we look at the sell orders, uh, we will see uh, we have 50 sell orders uh, sorry, 50 buy orders are created through trade routes, which is driving up the price of the clothing. And with dual track goods specifically, you can look to keep everything at the same price, roughly speaking, um, because you kind of want, uh, in terms of plus 75 plus um, or whatever. Also, notably, you can sometimes want to decrease the price of basic clothes because it's going to help the lower rung pops a little bit more. That's something we'll talk a little bit about more later. But we can, in order 
order to make the building overall more profitable, export the luxury clothes. Um, you don't ever want to really have one of the applicants be extremely expensive, the other really cheap, and you want to rely on trade in order to facilitate this. And so we have ourselves a nice, more profitable building. Often the luxury clothes will be cheap. You export them to make it work. Often a very good target for this export is going to be Great Xing. And so this is why developing trade with Great Xing early to export, you know, the luxury goods is going to be very, very important in practice as a general rule of thumb. That's porcelain, luxury clothes, and luxury furniture. <laughs> So pops are really the heart of the game in Victoria 3 and the way they interact with buildings is quite interesting uh, because the weekly balance is going to the ownership class. You notice this 2.2 thousand is quite a bit more than this 0.66k in wages, right? Uh, it's like roughly three times the amount uh, we have here is going to the ownership class and uh, these are going to kind of, you know, the worker class. But coming into the population tab, if we look at needs, the needs section, we will see that they are actually consuming a bunch of these goods. These are their needs. These are what they're spending money on. They're spending it on primarily grain, also liquor, also clothes. We notice here, one of the reasons this clothing thing can actually be profitable, again, is these prices being high. And so the consumption of the, our own economy is driving buildings to allow them to be profitable. And so you have this thing where the money will spin into the economy. The weekly balance here, it will get paid out uh, to the capitalist class, this higher upper strata, which in turn consume a whole bunch of furniture. The furniture manufacturers in turn will be given more profit because the things are more expensive and money spins and oscillates through the economy unless it gets destroyed or gets extracted from the government in some way. It's important to emphasize that this weekly positive balance is adding money to the economy. If the balance was exactly even, if there was no profit, then it would just be money spinning through the economy, which would still have a positive effect. However, with it being positive, this means that value is being added to the economy. And critically, this is one of the reasons why you want to be running a positive weekly balance. Now, one of the ways in which money is actually extracted from the economy and given to the government is and this is a preferable way is actually through reinvestment which happens at the side of dividends different ownership classes in this case the aristocrats will contribute a percentage of their dividends that is the positive balance the profit of the building they will contribute this to the investment pool which is a form of government income you see our investment pool here it's growing and then this gets paid out to construct buildings this is generally a hyper preferable way of extracting money from the economy you generally care about how you extract from your economy as long as you're under 600 to 800 million GDP, at which point it starts mattering less. And so at this point in the game, we would actually prefer not to lean into the aristocrats and we would prefer capitalist ownership, which is why earlier building a banana plantation as the UK is not necessarily what we want to do even though it is the most expensive thing in our market, uh, even though we have this plus 75 here, we would probably prefer to build iron actually, because iron, if we come in here, we ha as long as we're on atmospheric engine plus, is actually going to have capitalists as the ownership. Capitalists will invest 20% of their dividends into the investment pool, whereas landowners will only give, or aristocrats rather, will only give 10% of their income. And so this is why ownership class is extremely important. And this is one of the processes of industrialization you can think of. You are trying to move everything in the capital direction. In addition, capitalists will generally be from the industrialist class who is going to be going to pass a whole bunch of laws you like. One of the reasons why in the early game moving off of the early PMs that are going to be shopkeeper based is because shopkeepers only contribute 5% of their income to the investment pool. And so this is one critical aspect of, you know, getting on the road to industrialization in terms of thinking about who your pops are. You care about the ownership class being capitalists. Okay, so in the example of Great Britain, what might we do about the fruit if we're going to decide we want to build iron mines? Well, uh, we can, uh, first of all, we can import the fruit, uh, which you see we have a ton of profitable import routes 
And as we import, as long as we're on either protectionism or free trade, which we are on protectionism right now, um, the ownership of the trade centers will actually be capitalist. And so we will get better you know, contributions that way. So we could import and look to pass money instead to capitalists by importing this. Also, we could take a look at production methods as we talked about earlier. It's not just banana plantations that are gonna give this. In all of your grain stuff, you can see here, we have no apple orchards on our rye farms. We would produce less grain and instead produce a whole bunch more fruit, which would actually depress the price of fruit quite a lot to minus 75. And so looking for a little bit better PMs and trying to massage stuff in all the direction you want. And now we probably don't want it at minus 75. At this point, we might even want to export this. Uh, but these are a couple ways you can address it so that you can focus instead on capitalist oriented buildings, uh, especially buildings that are going to be invested in the construction loop, which we'll talk about later. Right now, we're going to talk a little bit more about industrialization. So the second thing, in addition to, you know, ownership, and this is really the more important thing as a process of industrialization is getting rid of your peasants. No, we're not going to let them starve to death. Instead, we want to find them jobs. Um, peasants, in particular, only consume 10% of what other pops consume, which means they're not driving prices up. They're not giving opportunities for profitable buildings but also they work on the subsistence farms and subsistence farms as far as buildings go are just disgustingly unprofitable you see here there's 320,000 peasants working here there's only a weekly balance of 5k and so the way you get rid of peasants other than letting them starve to death which we're not going to do that the way you get rid of peasants is by building more buildings which gives them the opportunity to work in a different building so um, this is going to be a critical thing if we expand these out then they will have new jobs available to them that they can work in now notably when we run out of peasants when we run out of available workers suddenly construction is not very useful but until then construction is going to be extraordinarily useful because it allows you to move pops from being peasants to instead being gainfully employed which will add tremendous value notably before we talk about construction it is important to note that running out of peasants is also a bad thing not because you've gotten all these peasants employed but now because your construction is going to be less useful and there's several ways you can think about trying to gain more population aka souls the most important resource in the game in victoria 3 and you can do this by raising standard of living and you can do it by uh, you know reducing mortality so implementing stuff like health systems uh, and increasing standard of living is going to increase, you know, generally speaking, uh, your population growth. You can also gain pops through migration, and you can also gain pops through uh, conquest. These are several ways. There's strategies behind each, but they're not really the focus of us here talking about buildings. <laughs> This brings us to construction and spending. Construction, of course, being a way in which you can spend money, but it is the way you are going to spend money in order to increase the size of your economy. Roughly speaking, you can think of your construction as your GDP growth rate, because every time you build a building, as long as you have available lever, uh, labor in the form of peasants, you will be expanding greatly uh, by adding you know, additional buildings, for the most part, that are going to have positive balance, which is going to increase the size of your economy, right? And so the bigger your construction number is, the faster your economy is growing. We also need to kind of talk about the interplay it has with in terms of the national balance. Um, a lot of times uh, newer players or players who are not familiar with Victoria 3 will think that a positive uh, balance is necessarily good. And this is not the case. What a positive balance indicates is that you are extracting money from the economy and what a negative balance indicates is that you are injecting money into the economy. Recall that you know one of the ways that the pops are paying money out to you is taxes. If they are paying in taxes, then they're not spending that money on goods. So they're not driving the price of the goods up in order to increase the profitability of the buildings. Now this is okay because you will re-inject it, but if you have a positive balance, if you're accumulating money, this is money that could have been spending in your economy and is instead not spending your economy. The best way to re-inject money into the economy is through adding construction. When you add construction, what happens is you start suffering a negative weekly balance, and this is being paid out from the treasury in the form of you know construction goods as well as government wages towards these laborers. You can see the 1.2k here. These are going to add buy orders to the economy of all of these goods of iron, wood, fabric, and tools. And remember, this is going to drive up the price of the good by creating more buy orders for iron, 
the price of iron goes up. This in turn will give us chances you know to build profitable buildings and so it will not only drive our opportunities to build profitable buildings it will also give us the means with which to build profitable buildings and so the way you want to approach especially the early game but also throughout most of the game is actually focusing really really hard on construction goods themselves in terms of what you're building and thinking back to what we were talking about earlier specifically the construction goods that are capitalist owned of these with iron frame buildings the capitalist owned buildings are going to be the iron mines they're going to be the wood chops and they are not going to be the fabric either through the livestock or the cotton plantations and then they are going to be the tools and so you will want to build up construction drive up the prices of these goods have opportunities to build profitable buildings, build those profitable buildings, and then this will make your construction cheaper. And this is a loop because it's feeding itself uh, and you're spinning money into the economy and then you're going to extract money into the economy. We'll come back to that later. But this is the most powerful thing, especially because your government balance, your balance will go down right as the prices of these goods go up which makes it so you're spending more money on construction but if a disproportionately large percentage of your economy is actually invested in these things when these economy when these prices go up this is also going to stimulate the economy and blunt the fact uh, that you are now paying more for construction goods and so it's not necessarily bad that these have increased in price it's just an opportunity for a profitable building uh, if notably you were expanding a ton of construction and you were adding stuff that may be profitable that may be capitalist owned such as clothing you know when the construction goods get expensive this will not increase the profitability of a whole bunch of your buildings if say you were importing the construction goods this is why it's so key and so important to actually be building these goods yourself and they are the most centrally important way of going about things now it's important to emphasize that if all you're building is these construction goods, if you're just coming in and you're just expanding these construction goods as much as possible, what this is going to do is it's going to have a downstream effect of giving you opportunities to build more profitable buildings. So construction will actually give you more opportunities to build profitable consumer goods like the textile mills. The way it does this is as a higher and higher proportion of your economy is stuck in on, you know, building iron, building wood, building tools, all of these guys will be making money. They will have positive balance, you know, in the buildings and this weekly balance, they will want to spend it. They will want to spend it on consumer goods, on their needs. And this will drive up the price because we're creating buy orders, right? And we are not building these consumer goods, we're building construction goods. So as the price drives up, it's going to squeeze up the price uh, you know, the building, overbuilding construction and building a ton of these construction goods is actually going to squeeze up the price of all the consumer goods, which in turn will give us opportunities to build profitable consumer good buildings. And so it stimulates the other portions of the economy by spending. Okay, so in order to grow our economy, we want to add construction, which raises, of course, the question, what is the best way to balance our budget, particularly in the early game, because this is what we're focused on right now, in order to balance best drive and give ourselves construction. Well, as we noted, we want to have capitalists because they are going to have more investment pool. In particular, this can be positively modified by two things. It can be modified by laissez-faire, which is kind of standard and is going to be best because it increases capitalist investment pool contribution efficiency. The way this modifier works is it just adds free money. The capitalists will always contribute 20% but this, when this is modified by, say, plus 25%, instead 25% of their dividend income, um, that amount will be added to the investment pool, which will be then used to pay for construction goods. Now, they are only taking 20% from the pop, but still 25% goes in there. So that extra 5% is just free money. And if it's free, it's for me. Shout out to the one loyalist here. And so what else we are going to want to do, especially in the early game, is we are going to want to spend and have as high taxes as possible. The reason for this is that as long as we have a lot of peasants, you know, as long as we have a ton of labor, they actually are better served from us getting them out of the subsistence farms than they are for paying less. So we, if we increase taxes, this will decrease 
the amount, it'll increase the amount of taxes, it'll decrease the amount they're spending on goods. So this will depress the economy. However, if we re-inject it, if we re-inject this and add more construction, the money will get re-injected and this will stimulate the economy and it will stimulate the economy in the industries we are trying to specialize in anyways. And so you would rather drive up the price of these goods than the consumer goods, at least initially. So we want to have max taxes generally most of the time. You can play around with government wages and military wages, but leaving them kind of in the middle slider or military wages a little high, um, this is less important than 1.5, can be a good way of going about it. We're just going to leave that for now and instead talk about consumption taxes. Consumption taxes are a great way to generate revenue. And in order to kind of come up with a consumption tax money, you do not want to actually just put in all the consumption taxes that generate the most revenue per authority. If you do this, it's okay. It's not the worst. Uh, but in particular, this will often lead you to taxing liquor, and there's actually a decent reason why you shouldn't tax liquor, um, but it won't be a huge mistake, and it's kind of a little bit of a decision. Uh, sometimes it actually will be better to tax liquor, and that has to do with pops. In particular, uh, there is what's known as exponential needs. As the wealth of uh, pops go up um, and start to get and use luxury goods in particular, like luxury clothing here, luxury furniture, and also porcelain, these will have an exponential need. So the amount of which they need in order to support their wealth level does not increase linearly. So it won't be the case that level one, you need five, level two, you need 10, you know, level three, you need 15. Instead, it'll be something like, or let's say 21. 21, you need uh, 10 of the good, 22, you need 27 of the good, 23, you need 50 of the good. It goes up and up and up in a non-linear way. And what this means is for them, for the upper strata pop, they benefit less from having additional money in terms of increasing their standard of living. Now, standard of living has a variety of positive effects on your country. And so you would prefer to extract money in a way that does not decrease standard of living as much. And by doing this, or the best way to do this, is to avoid taxing the lower rung strata because they will be most disaffected because they have the fewest, if none, in terms of exponential needs. Their needs are linear, and so when you prevent them from buying their needs, this will decrease their SOL more, which will decrease your average SOL more. Now that's a lot to kind of take in, but the, what the strategy is going to be in terms of your budget is you are going to want to add consumption taxes, the ones that generate the most money per authority, and this is primarily what you want to use your authority on. We will make another video on authority later, uh, but you are going to want to put in consumption taxes that specifically do not target the lower rung pops, and you can see here they are consuming a lot of opium and alcohol, so we actually don't want to put opium and alcohol in. Uh, these are in the intoxicant class of goods, uh, which lower rung pops do uh, need, and and instead, we would want to tax stuff like services and luxury clothing. So coming in here, we can take a look and we can find, you know, the most profitable thing. On a per authority basis, the absolute best is actually liquor here, but we are going to choose not to um, tax liquor. Now, if we have an absolutely enormous amount of like peasants, if we're talking like we're playing China, taxing liquor is probably good. But in our case, what we're going to do is we're going to tax services we are going to tax luxury clothes. We are going to tax, we could tax transportation, that's around 5K per 100 authority, but we see we could get 6K per 100 authority here, and 5.7K, and let's put in one more, kind of taking a look. We know opium, liquor, the lower strata will use. They will also, it might be transportation then, let's put in on transportation then, and this is going to be how we are taxing. So if we let the game unpause and think, we will see that or actually it's already in, in fact, we will see if we look and we look at consumption taxes category, we see that our consumption taxes are largely targeting the upper strata. They're paying 8.6 in taxes, of that 6.5 is the consumption tax. And while it's a little bit too much to unpack now, this will actually improve the consumption profile of the upper strata um, because it will lower their SOL slightly and when they have a middling high SOL this is actually preferable um, but we will be extracting money from them principally and these high taxes are not disaffecting uh, you know the lower strata as much as they would be if we were for example taxing liquor which or opium even which is what they spend eight percent of their income on. So to summarize, 
Buildings are the primary arm through which you interact in Victoria 3. You are generally going to want to use the latest and greatest, at least in the primary PMs. If you're running out of labor, you are going to want to use uh, the labor saving PMs as much as possible. And the secondary PMs you are going to want to use, that's stuff like luxury clothing, you are going to want to use depending on how the prices look and you're going to want to massage things according to price. One notable exception is for the primary PMs, you're, if it requires oil, you are very often not going to want to use it in some instances because there will be a lack of oil, roughly speaking. That is kind of the production methods. Profits are effectively the amount of money that gets injected into your economy. They do not go to your national treasury. They do not go to you directly. Instead, you extract money through various means, largely through taxes and stuff like the investment pool transfer, of which a portion of that is going to be coming from the profits. Uh, this is going to depend on what your ownership class is. Shopkeepers notably will donate 5%. Uh, capitalists, which are the most preferable, preferable, will be 20%. And then also with shopkeepers is farmers with 5%. And then at 10% is going to be the aristocrats, which means you're generally going to want to build industrialist owned buildings, at least before 800 million or so GDP. Um, also, you're going to need to be attentive to the price of goods as it relates to the profitability of the buildings. This will often mean doing stuff like importing your input goods in order to use the latest PM. For example, if we didn't have access to dyes, we would still want to switch to dyes and then figure out a way to get dyes. And also knowing that the building's outputs, the profitability of them is going to be, um, the price is going to be important. So you notice here, we have kind of cheap clothes. It would be nice for us to export the luxury clothes, notably for the thing we just talked about exporting particularly luxury clothes and driving the, up the price of luxuries disaffects our standard of living in our country less than exporting the basic goods and so it should be slightly preferable but exporting basic clothing also is okay uh, coming back into the building uh, the other essential element of the building is pops um, it's important to realize the way that economies work in victoria 3 is that they are going to spin money through the economy um, if we have a positive weekly balance this is going largely to the ownership cap class in this case capitalists and they will spend it on goods if the we have the textile mill owner and he buys furniture or he buys furniture this is going to drive up the price of furniture allowing us to have profitable buildings you want to think of high prices as being a good thing but a good thing because they are a signal. They are a signal that you have a chance for a profitable building. When you build a profitable building, you will drive down the price, and this is a consequence. Overall, the prices that you want are roughly middling, and this is a sharp deviation from most games in which you actually want to lower the price of goods. You do not want that in Victoria 3. If you have a really low price of goods, what that is likely indicative of, of is you having a huge monthly balance and you're just hoovering money out of the economy or you are in a hyper late game economy that is running huge shortages and then the other prices uh, or the other goods get depressed in price. And so um, this can very often happen beyond the scope of this video though. And so that is kind of the rundown on what is important in kind of evaluating buildings, which are the primary arm. You are going to, it's not a terrible strategy to build whatever's most expensive, but a better strategy is to build what's the most expensive, which is capitalist owned. And an even better strategy is going to be building the goods or focusing on the goods that are in the construction loop that are capitalist owned. This is going to be the sharp strategy for building, especially because if you drive up the price of the goods, you will increase government spend because you will increase the amount you're spending on construction goods. However, as you do this, since you are disproportionately, you have a disproportionately high amount of your own buildings in these industries, this will also increase the profitability of these buildings when the iron is high in price and the dividends is higher. We are going to be getting a higher weekly balance, which means we will be getting more from taxes and we will also be getting more from reinvestment. And so overall, this uh, makes everything to feel quite a bit smoother. You notably really don't want, if you are not building a lot of these goods, that are being used in the construction sector, you really don't want them to be expensive. And finally, we talked about the overall strategy for the budget, which is going to be in the early game, specifically when you have a lot of peasants, it's important to emphasize, construction's really good when you have a lot of peasants, right? Um, and then it falls off. When you have a lot of peasants though, you wanna run max taxes, you wanna put in consumption taxes, specifically the ones that are targeting the upper class will be preferable, even if they're slightly less efficient, but if you have a huge amount of 
peasants or they're wildly more efficient, you will want to tax stuff like liquor and opium, which the lower class people use. Shout out to drugs. And then we will also want to maybe not fiddle with these. You can do it, but that's a little bit more of an advanced strategy. Very importantly, we do not want to sit on this positive balance. Instead, we want to re-inject it and we want to re-inject it in the form of adding construction sectors, which you can think of as your GDP growth rate. And this is how you grow your economy. You also notably, when you run out of pops, you want to start adding more pops or figuring out ways to get more pops. One of these is going to be actually starting to rethink lowering the taxes to raise SOL in addition to, you know, also taxing the low, uh, the upper run pops rather than the lower, in addition to putting in health institutions, finding ways to achieve migration and also conquest, but that's really beyond the scope of this video here. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please feel free to like, comment, subscribe. We are trying to reach 10,000 subs by the end of the year. And other than that, other than that, have a good day and happy uh, industrializing.